This is for ISOL 631. Textbook is Security Policies and Implementation Issues. This is for Chapter 9, User Domain Policies. A tenant of telecommunications says that more people who access a network, the more valuable the network becomes. This is called Metcalfe's Law. Consider a telephone system as an example. If only two telephones are on the system, the value of that system is limited. Only two people can talk at any given time. But add millions of phones and people, and suddenly the value of the network rapidly increases. This increase in the number of people accessing your network, along with the introduction of new and emerging technology, like mobile devices, has dramatically increased the number of security risks. If the user population and the diversity of technology increases, so does the need to access information. This need translates into complex security controls that must be maintained. Indubitably, this complex jumbo of controls leads to gaps in protection and security risks. This chapter examines different types of users on networks, Re reviews individual need for access, and how those needs lead to risks that must be controlled. We will also discuss how security policies mitigate risks in the user domain. So the learning objective for this chapter it is described the different information system security policies associated with the user domain. So the topics we will look at are what the weakest link in the information security chain is, what different types of users there are, how to govern different types of users with policies, what acceptable use policies are, what the significance of a privileged level access agreement is, what security awareness policies are, what best practices for user domain policies are, and what the difference between least access privilege and best fit access privilege is. The key concepts that we will look at in this chapter are reasons for governing users with policies, regular and privileged users, acceptable use policy and privileged level access agreement, security awareness policy, and the differences between public and private user domain policies. So the goals of this chapter are to understand why users are considered the weakest link in implementing security policies and controls, understand the different users in the typical organization, explain how different users have different information needs, define the acceptable use policy, define the privileged level access agreement, explain how an SAP can reduce risks which is a security awareness policy, explain the importance of risk acceptance in understanding security risks, and identify several best practices related to user domain policies. The weakest link in the information security chain. Security experts consider people the weakest link in security. Unlike automated security controls, different people have different skill levels. People can also let their guard down, they get tired or distracted, and may not have information security in mind when they do their jobs. Automated controls have advantages over people. An automated control never sleeps or takes a vacation. An automated control can work relentlessly and execute flawlessly. The major advantage 
people have over automated controls is the ability to deal with the unexpected. An automated control is limited because it can mitigate only risks that it has been designed for. Social engineering. People can be manipulated. Social engineering occurs when you manipulate or trick a person into weakening the security of an organization. Social engineering comes in many forms. One form is simply having a hacker befriend an employee. The more intimate the relationship, the more likely the employee may reveal knowledge that can be used to compromise security. Another method is pretending to be from the IT department. This is sometimes called pretexting. A hacker might call an employee and convince him or her to reveal sensitive information. Another technique is to ask an employee to link to an internal web page to verify the network performance. On that internal web page, the user is then prompted to enter the ID and password and provide some random number noted that the response time on the network is good. When user doesn't realize that the internal web page is a fake and has just captured the user's ID and password, as the method and sophistications of hackers improve, so must the awareness training for the users. Social engineering accounts for 29% of data breaches in 2013. According to a report published in 2014 by Verizon, social engineering is attractive because of the case which data can be obtained, the ease with which data can be obtained compared with hacking. Breaking through automated controls like a firewall can take weeks, months, or even years. Hackers may never be able to bypass the controls of a well-protected network. If they do, they will, might still not get access to information they want. Breaking through a firewall does not necessarily provide access to data to protect it at server. And even if the hackers access data, they may not be able to send it outside the network. Bottom line for a hacker is that they may be easier to call employees and polls as an IT department employee. This can be accomplished within a short time and take only one individual letting his or her guard down to succeed. Human mistakes. One characteristic all humans share is that we all make mistakes. Mistakes come from carelessness, fatigue, lack of knowledge, or inadequate oversight or training. Humans may perceive a security threat that does not exist, and someone may miss a real threat as obvious to an objective observer. Carelessness can be as simple as writing your password on a sticky note and leaving it on your keyboard. It can also be failing to read warning messages, but still click OK. Carelessness can occur because an employee is untrained or does not perceive information security as important. Careless employees are prime targets for hackers who develop malicious code. These hackers count on individuals to be their point of entry into the network. Another form of carelessness is intimidating people into weakening security controls out of convenience. Carelessness can also be a result of lack of common computer knowledge. Technology often outpaces an employee's skills, just as some employees acquire a solid understanding of a system or application is upgraded or replaced. Programmers can also make mistakes. This is particularly a concern when those programmers introduce a code error into a product with millions of users. A significant threat to information security comes from the user who is an insider. The same report mentioned previously also noted that 31% of data breaches in 2013 were due to insider threats. The term insider refers to an employee, consultant, contractor, or vendor. 
insider may even be an IT technical person who designed the system, application, or security that is being hacked. The insider knows the organization and the applications. The IT department insider knows what is logged and what is checked and not checked. This person may even have access to local accounts shared between the administrators. As a result, the IT insider has an easier time bypassing security controls and hiding his or her tracks. Insiders can hide their tracks by deleting or altering logs and timestamps. Knowing where the logs are kept and how frequently they are checked is a great advantage to an insider. Regular employees with a long history with the organization may also pose a risk. These employees may be in position of trust. These individuals have a sense of how the organization responds to incidents and can tailor their attack accordingly. Insiders are not limited to regular employees. They can also include be vendors and suppliers. Security policies and controls can help limit damage and threats. Security policies ensure access is limited to individual roles and responsibilities. This means the damage from using an insider's credentials is limited to that function. Additionally, a policy may be required that an individual's access be removed immediately upon leaving the organization. These types of user controls can reduce risk. You can build better security policies and controls by understanding user needs. There's no fixed number of user types possible on a network. For example, a salaried employee may be a full-time experienced professional or a part-time college student. Depending on the business though, there are, may, may be different sets of security issues associated with these two types of employees. To illustrate common user needs, this chapter focuses on seven basic user types, which as follow. There are employees who are salaried or hourly staff members of the organization, system administrators, employees who work in the IT department to provide technical support to the systems, security personnel, these are people responsible for designing and implementing a security program within an organization. Contractors, they're temporary workers who can be assigned to any role. Contractors are directly managed by the company in the same manner as employees. Vendors, these are outside companies or individuals working for such companies hired to provide ongoing services to the organization, such as building cleaning. Unlike contractors, vendor employees are directly managed by the vendor company to perform specific services on the organization's network. Guests and the general public, a class or group of users who access a specific set of applications and then control partners individuals who evaluate controls for design and effectiveness. The figure on the screen is an example of types and subtypes of users. So the user domain, one of the seven domains of a typical IT infrastructure, consists of a variety of users. Each user type has unique access needs. As the different types of users in the domain grow, so does the security complexity. At a minimum, each type of user has unique business needs and thus requires unique rights to access certain information. Within each of these major types of users, the rights are further defined into subtypes. Each subtype might be further broken up and so on. For example, your organization might have many types of administrators. Number depends on the size of the organization, complexity, and team specializations. May further separate rights 
between Oracle and Microsoft SQL Database Administrators. In addition to these human user types, all with different access needs, you should also be aware of two other groups. They are really account types rather than user types. System accounts are non-human accounts used by the system to support automated service. Contingent IDs are non-human accounts until they are assigned to individuals who use them to recover a system in the event of a major outage. So again, the contingent accounts, they need unlimited rights to install, configure, repair, and recover networks and applications and to restore data. Credentials are prime targets for hackers. IDs are not assigned to individuals until a disaster recovery event is declared. And then the system accounts. They need elevated privileges, privileges to start, stop, and manage system services. Accounts can be inactive or non-interactive. System accounts are also referred to as service accounts. So different users are going to have different business needs and different access needs. Now the seven types of users that we talked about earlier, for example, employees need to access specific applications in the business production environment. So their access needs is limited to specific applications and information. For system administrators, their business need is to access systems and databases to support applications. So the access that they need is broad and unlimited in context of the role. For example, a database administrator may have unlimited access to the database, but not the operating system. For security personnel, their business need is to protect the network, systems, applications, and information. But the access that they need is to set permissions, view logs, monitor activity, and respond to incidents. For contractors, the business need is to be a temporary worker needing the same access as a full-time worker in the same role. What they need to access is the same as it would be for a full-time employee. Vendors' business need is to access the network, systems, and application to perform contractor services. So the access that they need is limited to specific portions of the network, systems, and applications. Guests and the general public, they need access to specific application functions. So their access is assigned to a type of user and not to the individual. Control partners have a business need to review and access controls. So the access they need is often includes unlimited read access to logs and configuration settings. Contingent IDs have a business need to recover system and data during an outage. So their access is unlimited across both operating systems and databases. Additionally, they may also require broad access to network devices such as a firewall and data backups. And then the systems accounts. The business need to start, stop, and perform automated system services. So the access should be limited to the system function being performed. So looking at the differences and similarities to users, depending on whether or not it's a private organization or a public organization. So similarities for private organizations may follow public compliance laws, depending on their governance requirements. And public organizations might be small in size, thus have similar control over their user population. Differences, though, public organizations must follow Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, also called SOX. 
the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, many times referred to as HIPAA, and other compliance laws. Private organizations are often smaller and easier to control from a user standpoint, and private organizations may not follow public compliance laws. The Acceptable Use Policy. It is important to set clear expectations for what's acceptable behavior for those using an organization's technology assets. An acceptable use policy defines the intended uses of computers and networks, including acceptable use and the consequences for violation of policy. An acceptable use policy also prohibits access or storage offense, offensive content. The following topics are typically found in an acceptable use policy. There are the basics of protecting an organization's computer networks, managing passwords, managing software licenses, managing intellectual property, email etiquette, level of privacy an individual should expect when using an organization's computer or network, and uncompliance consequences. A good, acceptable use policy should also be accompanied with awareness training. This training should address realistic scenarios an individual might face. Following situations are a few examples of what might show up on an acceptable use policy awareness training. Coworker asks you to log on to the network or an application because he or she is waiting for access to be approved. What would you do in that case? You receive a politically insensitive joke via email. Should you forward the email? And person next to you spends many hours a day surfing the internet for stock tips. What should you do? A Privilege Level Access Agreement, or PAA. When administrative rights are breached or abused, the impact can be catastrophic to the organization. A privileged level access agreement is designed to heighten the awareness and accountability of those users who have administrative rights. The privileged level access agreement is a formal agreement signed by an administrator acknowledging his or her responsibilities. The agreement basically says the administrator will protect these sensitive credentials, not abuse his or her authority. The Privilege Level Access Agreement is an enhanced form of security awareness specifically for administrators. It is typically a one or two page document. It reads as a formal agreement between the administrator and the organization. It generally contains the following from the administrator's perspective. Acknowledgement of the risk associated with elevated access in the event the credentials are breached or abused. Promised not to share the credentials entrusted to his or her care. Promised to use access granted only for approved organization business. Promised not to accept attempt to hack or breach security. Promise to protect any output from these credentials such as reports, logs, files, and downloads. Promise to report any indication of breach or intrusion promptly. Promise not to tamper with, modify, or remove any security controls without authorization. Promise not to install any backdoor, malicious code, or unauthorized hardware or software. Promise not to violate intellectual property rights, copyrights, or trade secrets. Promise not to access or store inflammatory materials such as pornography. Promise not to browse data as not directly related to assigned tasks. And promise to act in good faith, be subjected to penalties under breach of contract and criminal statutes. In many respects, these 
items are already covered by security policy and awareness training. The privilege level access agreement reinforces the importance of these terms and for administrators. The federal government uses privilege level access agreements in the defense industry, but few organizations outside the defense industry have adopted their use. The Security Awareness Policy, or SAP. Security awareness training is often the first view a typical user has into information security. It's often required for all new hires. Think of it as the first impression of management's view of information security. This is management's opportunity to set the tone. Most individuals want to do a good job, but they need to know what the rules and expected behavior are. A good security awareness policy has many benefits, including informing workers of the following. The basic principles, information security, awareness of risks and threats, how to deal with unexpected risk, how to report uh, suspicious activity, incidents, and breaches, and to how to help build a culture that is, sec that is security and risk aware. Security policy is not just a good idea, it's the law. There are many organizations that require security policies and security awareness program. Many state laws also require security awareness. Having a security awareness program is considered in most industries a best practice. Following highlights, highlights a number of federal mandates that required an organization to have a security awareness program. HIPAA, or the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, the Graham Leach Lilly Act, Sarbanes Oxley Act, Federal Information Security Management Act, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST Guide for Developing Security Plans for Information Security Systems, and the NIST Computer, Computer Security Handbook. The laws can outline the frequency and target audience of awareness training. For example, the 5 CFR requires security awareness training before an individual can access information. It's also a refresher course must be taken annually. Some examples of the requirements are all users need to have security basics, executives have policy level and governance, program the functional managers have to have security management, planning and implementation into risk management and contingency planning. Chief information officers have broad training in security planning systems and application security management, risk management and contingency planning. IT security program managers have broad training in security planning systems and application security management and risk management and contingency planning. The auditors would have broad training in security planning systems and application security management, risk management, and contingency plan planning. IT functional manager and operations personnel have broad training in security planning, systems applications, security management, system application lifecycle management, risk management, and contingency planning. For information security policies to deliver value, they must explain how to manage risk and proactively address threats. Well-planned security awareness program can be a cornerstone to accomplish this objective. A best practice is a leading technique, methodology, or technology that through experience has proved to be very reliable. Best practices tend to produce a consistent and quality result. The following short list of best practices focuses on the users 
and is found in security policies. These best practices go a long way towards protecting users and organizations. Policies should require the following practices. Attachments. Never open an email attachment from a source that is not trusted or known. Encryption. Always encrypt sensitive data that leaves the confines of a secured server. This includes uh, encrypting laptop, backup tapes, emails, and so on. Layer defense. Use an approach that establishes overlapping layers of security as the best way to mitigate threats. Least privilege. The principle of least privilege is that individuals should have only the access necessary to perform their responsibilities. Best fit privilege. Principles of best fit access privilege holds that individuals should have the limited access necessary to fulfill their responsibilities and have their access managed effectively. Patch management. Be sure all network devices have the latest security patches, including user desktop and laptop computers. Patch management is an essential part of layer defense. Even when you do everything right, there might be a vulnerability in the vendor's system or application. An effective patch management program mitigates many of these risks. Unique identity. All users accessing information must use unique credentials to identify who they are. Only exception is public access of a publicly facing website. And virus protection. Virus and malware protection must be installed on every desktop and laptop computer. Understanding least access privilege and best fit privileges. The difference between least access privilege and best fit access privileges can be confusing and subtle. Both control risk by limiting access associated with a specific role or job. The difference is that the least privileges custom access to the individual and best fit privileges typically customize access to the group or class of users. For example, suppose you have four accounts receivables with specialists. Accounts receivable teams typically collect an invoice due to a company. The four specialists, two work on commercial accounts and two work on, on individual accounts. Their access is the same, except that the commercial receivable specialists also require access to market information about the companies related to the commercial accounts. Under lease privileges, you might choose to limit access to the market information to just the commercial receivable specialist. However, this decision comes at a cost. We'd have to maintain two sets of access rules for basically the same job. When you multiply these subtle differences across the large populations of users and technologies, these rule differences can be quite complex and sensitive to expensive to maintain. Best fit privileges would look at the risk of giving access to the market data to the two specialists working with non-commercial accounts. If there is little to no risk of fraud or security exposure, then all four specialists may get the same access. Typically, this means assigning access to receivable specialist role and then assigning all four individuals to that role. Using this bet fit based risk-based approach to assign access can lower support costs and simplify access rules. So who develops these user policies? They include the Chief Financial Officer, the Chief Operation Officer, the Information Security Manager, the IT Managers, the Marketing and Sales Managers, unit managers, materials managers, purchasing managers, and inventory managers. So this chapter examined the risks associated with user domain, part of the seven domains of an IT infrastructure. 
As number of users grows on the network, their diverse needs also grow. Security policies are a structured way of managing the user-related risks in this complex environment. The chapter reviewed the many different types of users and discussed unique roles such as administrator, security, and auditor. With these roles often comes elevated privilege and enormous responsibility. Security policies are an effective way to reduce risks and govern users. They help identify the higher risk activities such as those performed by system administrators. Policies are based on principles to help apply security consistently. These principles include the core concepts such as least access privilege and best fit privileges. Principles lay out risk choices and must strike a balance between costs to maintain and risks to control. In the end, security policies can educate users, reduce human error, and be used to better understand how incidents occur.